let me take a sip of coffee. <laughs> mm -hmm. right, let me first just put my shades on. <laughs> These are prescriptions, so I can see. I <laughs> have my little legal pad. I was gonna set you down, but I'm just gonna prop up against my car. Let's just try this again. So I have my little legal pad here of just my quick little research and my clinical notes. So I have the presenting problems of my plant patients and some of the, this is, this is probably so nerdy, but I have my presenting symptoms to look out for and the treatments on each of these diagnoses that I think are the diagnoses. <laughs> Again, this is not this is not a sexy video. This is for I hope it is educational. Uh, it's certainly been educational for me just to do the research. So I feel like I've done enough blabbing, and I want to go around and show show you what I think is going on. So let's go to part one. But first, the all-important coffee. Coffee shot. Right? Okay. So, here we are at patient number one, which is my lilac tree. But first, I need to break for beautiful Willow in the door. Look at her. Hi. She's just the sweetest. Hi, baby. <laughs> Patient number one. This is my lilac tree. And from the bottom up, it looks quite fine. You wouldn't really notice anything that's going on. And I did work on limbing up this tree. Limbing up just simply means cleaning up any of the suckers at the bottom of the plant, uh, creating airflow. So you'll see this is a pretty small space. This doesn't look like this hydrangea tree has been limbed up because it is so heavy with the blooms on top, but it is, I think, that's one way to help to prevent disease or spread of disease is by promoting air circulation and removing any leaves or foliage at the base of the plant where a lot of moisture is retained and can form a lot of diseases or fungi which could spread to the plant or surrounding plants. However, even with limbing up this plant, and there is a good amount of airflow in here, I did notice if we go to the top, there goes Willow. Look, I don't know how well you can see that, but we have got some yellowing. It looks like the center is pretty well Again, I did work hard on limbing it up earlier this spring, but even with that, like I'm noticing, so these leaves look really healthy. They're like green, luscious, but then you look right here, we've got some yellowing, browning, curling of the leaves. So, and I, thankfully it's not all around, it's in this spot and I think I see some back there, so I'm hoping it's contained. Oh, so my diagnosis is, my first diagnosis is, I think that this is blight. Um, let me just look at my notebook over here. So I'm gonna read it. <laughs> so a symptom of this infection, so it is an infection caused by a pathogenic organism. So not a fungi or fungus. The presenting symptoms, we have yellowing, spotting, withering. Those are some of the top presenting symptoms and I have all of those with this lilac, unfortunately. So 
treatment it had listed a fungicide or antibiotics however I don't want to go that route right now because I I want to try to be as preventative with my treatment measures so what I'm proposing is I'm going to get my loppers and prune out this infected the infected um, branches and leaves and then I'm going to sanitize the heck out of those loppers because I do not want to go ahead and prune and lop all of the infected plant material and then go ahead and use my loppers say on my hydrangea tree because that would just spread disease so I guess the way I'm thinking of it is just hand washing but for your tools because you don't want to spread disease from patient to patient or from plant to plant so that's what we are going to do on patient numero uno let me just go in on the inside to try and get a better look so these ones look good it doesn't look so bad from here but when I'm standing up on those steps that's when I notice it let's go to patient number two but first let me take a sip quiet Friday morning I ended up taking up off the last few days from work it was my birthday so I finally get the morning to just go around and really assess my garden sometimes we get so busy that we do not have the time okay so this is patient number two all right, patient number two is my prairie fire crab apple tree. Just got it this spring. These are beautiful specimens. For a background, they are fairly disease resistant to my knowledge. They are very clean crab apple trees, clean meaning that they don't drop all of their fruits like you would commonly see with a lot of crab apples. So I was excited to hear about that. Also, I'm working on providing uh, getting plants that provide interest all year long so not just bloom once and look pretty but we want interest for spring summer fall winter etc so winter interest this would be a great structure fall interest the leaves turn this bright beautiful red just like the name prairie fire spring there's beautiful bright pink fragrant flowers stunning and summer it just looks beautiful so there's the little breakdown and it only will get eight to ten feet tall so i'm hoping to prune it have it just be a very nice structure for this garden but not too shaded for the area that i can't have any underplanting survive so anyway enough about this beauty i don't know if you can see those little cobwebs too we're gonna give her a rinse down okay so i was inspecting this tree and it's always good to inspect your leaves so you guys see that yeah okay so we have on the top some reddening a reddening spot to the leaf and then if you flip it over we have some growth whoops let me see I'm gonna try and get closer to this tree without damaging the other stuff I've got going on and well this is tricky when you're trying to do it <laughs> with two hands okay here we go okay so you can see that there's some reddening and then also these projections coming out of the plant and if you're a anatomy nerd 
think of it like the cilia, I think. That's how my mind goes, the cilia. Yeah, you know, these are little hairs within the body. Um, anyway, I'm probably going a little too far into that, but or like little phalanges. Yeah, look at that. Anyway, so if we break out my little notepad, <laughs> my diagnosis for this guy is what is known as cedar apple rust. I'm gonna call it crab apple rust. So it's apparently very common. And now that I'm looking at it again, I see another. There's another, there's another one back there. But it's very common. It's a fungus or fungi, and it rarely causes damage. So symptoms are leaf spots. Sometimes they start out yellow and then turn red, like this one. And the little growth-like spots are underneath the leaves, as we'll see here. That's underneath the leaf. And it's released by spores. So typically, like after it rains, anything like that, the rain will cause the spores to spread and fly. Um, treatment is typically with, I think, a fungicide as well, but you can also use copper and sulfur, only if you do not plan on eating the crab apples. I think for this one, if it's not causing the leaves to fall off and die, there's no damage to the tree itself. It looks very healthy otherwise. And because it sounds like it causes very little damage, if any, we're just going to watch and wait this one. I started to pick off some of the leaves and then put it in this pile that I will have taken away or we're going to take it away that will not be composted because what you don't want to do is prune out all of this infected material and then go ahead and compost it because then if you were to use that for future gardening you're just going to have those spores spread all throughout your garden so we're not going to do that anything we cut out we're going to take away you just monitor watch and wait and just keep my fingers crossed that the fungus doesn't start to spread and cause any damage i don't think it will just because from what i was reading it's not common that it will but if you were ever curious what to look out for, look for that. Eee. Oh boy, there's the money shot. Okay. On to Patient number three, actually patient number three also has a cousin, patient number four, but maybe I'll just stop referring to them as patients. <laughs> so here we go. Okay, this I, I know pretty well actually. So from last year I started to grow pumpkins and started to notice these white spots white grayish spots on the leaves let me try to get a good one so you can see whoops there's some starting to develop and then there's a little bit more and then more don't judge me or pay attention to that pumpkin in the back i tried to do an experiment this year to grow a pumpkin in a pot they just need a lot more attention and nutrients than I could give give them. So, yikes. Oh, I think that one's past saving. But the pumpkins that are in the beds, these are doing great, minus the pottery mildew. But that is extremely common for cucurbits. Is that the right pronunciation? Essentially, Pumpkin, squash, watermelon. Uh, what else did I have on there? Let me go to my notepad. Whoops, let me go back a page. Okay. Yeah, gourds. Okay. So 
Powdery mildew is a, another type of fungal disease and the way it presents itself are the spotting, so the white grayish spotting, and then will spread throughout. It uh, is quite common in a couple of different climates. This was surprising to me that it also appears in dry, warm climates. I thought it would only be in areas that get a lot of rain and are really damp. However, if you live in a dry, warm climate that has a higher humidity level, you may find that some of your plants are prone to powdery mildew. So where it can start to present itself is with overcrowding, as you'll see. I did it to myself, unfortunately, because I, if you'll see, I do have a small space and I get kind of selfish and want to try and cram in as much as I can. So if you do plan to plant pumpkins or squash or watermelon, gourds, things like that, don't do what I did <laughs> and make sure that you have enough space between each plant. Oh, there's a plane going overhead. So make sure you have enough space and circulation for the plant to breathe and if you can install a drip irrigation system it doesn't have to be expensive i'm going to try to next year just put in some black tubing punch a few holes in it and do my own little drip irrigation for next year i think i'm going to try and keep it relatively inexpensive however i'm not too worried about this right now because it is not it's it's not going to be right now it's not damaging to the plant and it's very common for these type of specimens to get powdery mildew so at least in my area it is so and it doesn't damage it can damage the fruit if it's severe severe but this is just very minimal right now. So that is what's going on for patient number three.
right guys I think I'm almost done I think I have one more branch to take out I was not prepared for how emotionally hard that is to trim out these branches and it's leaving a pretty big hole which is really sad but also I do want to make sure that I remove anything that could potentially kill the entire tree and I feel like I'm catching it early enough where hopefully we can help to keep it localized so let me just show you look at the inside oh so I'll just show you how I've been checking to see if I've gotten the hole oh dear <laughs> oh dearie okay well you'll see so this foliage is still pretty dark and green on the right hand side we still have a little bit of yellowing left. I think just maybe that one. See the, the curling and browning of the tips. I'm not seeing any spotting or yellowing over here. Just very slightly. There's a little bit right there too. So, hmm. I think I'll just take off that one branch there and keep an eye on it and I don't see any other but you'll see it's just the center that was hit more with the blight so I think I just have that one more to do what to do what to do well okay I think I'll just tackle that one for now and if I see anything else on the inside of the canopy but at least the majority is out right now so let's go tackle that one really prominent one to me right there So even though that was extremely hard to do, I do feel like it is the best thing for the health of the plant or the tree. So as you'll see, there is a big hole remaining. However, the majority of the curling, wilted and spotted leaves and yellowing leaves are now gone. So I'm hoping that we did nip it in the bud and take care of the situation before it really progressed because that would be really painful to lose this lilac tree or lilac bush whatever you want to call it it's so beautiful and I would hate to lose it so unfortunately we must do, uh, do challenging things and difficult things in order to get the results that we're looking for so have you ever had to do a harsh pruning that was really difficult emotionally not just physically this this was tough for me so in the first time I've ever dealt with blight or what I suspect is blight and I would have hated to just let it go and not take some sort of precautionary measure so Here's hoping that new growth will flush in and full, fill in the center, so. And let me fix the flag. Come here, oh, 
my short little arms. <laughs> there we go. Okay. So, hopefully we saved her. Now I want to show you the branches that I removed. So, not all of them were super yellow, but they started to look like they were beginning to turn. So, I thought it would probably be best just to take it out. So, there's the yellowing leaves with the browning tips. This one was really starting to go and curl. And I noticed, I don't know if this is typical of blight, but there's some, I noticed this was common on some of the ones that had the yellowing. It was like this deep scaling. So I don't know what that is. I'm wondering if that's part of what's going on or if that's just typical of lilac trees in general. But I did remove pretty much all of the branches that I noticed, the browning and yellowing leaves and what looks like a dying appearance <laughs> to me just to be safe. So again, I'm not gonna compost this. This is gonna get hauled away. So now I am actually underneath the shared canopy that I've tried to limb both the lilac tree and the hydrangea tree into kind of a secret private archway. Um, yeah, so that was tough. <laughs> that was a lot tougher than I thought it was going to be taking out those branches. I just couldn't risk it to the tree itself, overall health of the tree. And I'm fairly confident that it is the beginning stages of blight. I just have to keep an eye on the surrounding branches just to make sure that those don't start to turn and go as well. So we'll see, we'll keep an eye on that. And the powdery mildew on my pumpkins and my Veronica, I'll keep an eye on. I think I'll clean up a little bit more of the super tunias around the base of the Veronica and then just keep an eye on the pumpkins. So those I'll just take some, some measures to control pretty much and then monitor. And the crab apple rust, I'm not so worried about as I initially was. That one's really just monitor every once in a while just to make sure that it's not popping up on additional leaves or compromising the health of the tree itself so i'll keep a watchful eye i hope that this was educational it was for me just to go around and assess the health of my plants and trees and then kind of create a care plan and take steps further to monitor the health of the garden because the garden is a living and breathing organism and i just want to make sure even though i do have such a small space and a small plot i want to be a good steward of the garden and keep the health of my plants and wildlife around it in the best overall health i can <laughs> um, without the use of harsh chemicals and anything that would be detrimental to this little ecosystem that I am lucky enough to be able to garden in. So I could ramble on forever. 